whole thematic of this Congress yeah. and is pegged on sustainability. Yeah. But the last line, the tagline, which is there, that we leave no one behind, mm -hmm. uh, is what caught our attention. I want to ask you, what according to you is this no one? Who is this no one that we are not leaving behind? Yeah. Or who is all yeah. who we need to carry with us? Yeah. Okay, wow. Yeah, this is a, a tough topic, let's say. Uh, let no one behind can be understand that we have to work and get every member of a given community or part of society be involved, you know? Um, so if basically you create a new building, um, it doesn't make everyone indifferent. If you go through, you will, you know, you will be um, seeing the building, you know, you will experience the building. But in terms of economy, it is about thinking not to just be focused on those that can afford, but make sure that we take everyone with us. And it also means not to neglect or to discriminate those that can afford. So it's just to go together hand on hand, trying to find solution um, and creating comfort for people we have to care for. Architecture, to me, is caring, you understand? And so uh, if you say, don't let no one behind, is meaning to think about the holistic subject and topic uh, around, uh, you know, building. We were listening to you and we, the word polarization came yeah. a lot of time in the, in the discussion just a while ago. When we talk about polarization, we talk about, we keep human in mind. Yeah. What about the other living organism and yeah. other living species and other life around us, yeah. the trees, the plants, the resources, yeah. Yeah. the microorganisms yeah. aren't we polarizing our thoughts only keeping human body in mind mm -hmm. i think thinking about nature in general with other spaces is so fundamental in that because i'm going to say there is like the base of our life with no trees with no plants with no animals so our planet planet won't exist and so uh, it's, not to f it's not to be just focused on we, but to focus on everything that made us be capable of staying on this planet. And trees, animals, micro mi microbe, and whatever is surrounding us is fundamentally part of the debate. Yes, yes. It's not just to say for human, but plants, the biodiversity, plants and animals, as it's like it is, that what make us exist as human beings. So how does that inform your practice then? Yeah. A lot, a lot. So, so I, you know, I am not just building. I am doing landscaping myself um, within my team. So first thing that I will do every time when I'm in a place is to plant trees, you know, or to create a vegetable garden to fit my team if it is a design build project, you know, and connecting them again to nature so it is always like things going together. Um, that is what I'm doing. And of course, if you use material that are not just uh, causing a big burden to environment, you also protecting environment. And uh, within, uh, so with everything being involved in that nature. There was a little debate inside about natural resource yeah. versus artificial resource. Yeah, yeah. And uh, even when we, using natural material, we're consuming something. Yeah. Um, and the depletion of that natural resource is also a concern. How does a natural resource outlive the creation or the, or the work which you do with that natural resource? Outliving that life of that natural resource is also critical. Yeah. No, um, I think it's always about not to being abusive. By, by using a, a given material. Natural materials are limited, you know, in term. Um, if you use wood, we could say it is a plant, you could just plant, it can regenerate. But you need to work like a, a, in parallel. You know, the more you're extracting it from nature, you have to plant. And so the way that you, in a given number of years, you could just get the material. So if you extract a, a given mineral, 
or construction material excessively, one day it may disappear. But if you're taking passive material like clay, uh, that it will be filling again, etc. and etc. and going back to the life cycle uh, after demolition, however, um, I mean, that is positive. I think that we have to think about not to be abusive in the way we use material and to really be smart uh, and modest. I think it's about trying always to be smart, to see in the given place what is abundant. So, and how can I use this in a non-excessive way, you understand, just in the smart way, just to take what is needed and not to really do, keep putting more because you have more and just putting less to achieve something that is more, that is bigger. That is how we could just really guarantee sustainability in any kind of, it's not just about the quantity of the material, but introducing, but how much so and not too much. You see that people, you get, people get involved, they start to appreciate that what has been created, their respect, and then maintenance is ease because they have the knowledge, because they feel ownership of what has been created. And that is what empowerment is having as a consequence. And then people that has been educated, has learned something, you know, they can just apply it again. So you're creating a multiplication factor, which we needed. It's just transfer is happening. And that is the way we could just create good ideas among many, many other activists. And so this way, we, the impact will be big and it is good for our future and sustainability. No, I will say, I, there is a mini, mini project where I say, wow, well done, well done. I say, wow, I'm happy this person did it uh, because, wow, what a great idea. So um, it's good. I would have loved to be so creative like him, but I appreciate to see people doing amazing things. It's just pushing me to keep thinking and to say, we have many, many doing same things. And if it's good for the world, I just enjoy and being happy and get inspired by it. Yeah. With like-minded professionals uh, who think like you, are you willing to start a movement? Because as we've said, time is running out. Yeah, yeah. A movement is needed at a very, very fast pace. Yeah. What are your thoughts and are you willing to start a movement? Yeah, yeah. Or have you already started a movement? Yeah. Unconsciously, uh, you know, I have like this workshop in Burkina that can grow up to 500 people where we are active trying to create things and getting people to be involved. I mean, that is a slow process, but it's a very efficient one uh, because it's related to action, to the making, you know? So you could just find platform where you spread the idea, talk about it, that is parallel to it. Um, I think I, I am focused on the making and if there is a movement where you really, you get people move and to exchange ideas and to push a certain goal to happen, uh, I will join but I haven't created a platform like that yet. <laughs> Your first international recognition yeah. happened with that Aga Khan Award, which oh, you yeah. won for oh, a school. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what has been the challenges or the opportunities you got while you were practicing in Africa and your global recognition, has that benefited you? Has it given you any, or has it, has it been challenging in many ways? Yeah. Has the expectations, from the world has gone much higher. Yeah. Um, do you find that restrictive? No, um, no, it was an encouragement. Aga Khan was a big encouragement. And I found that it has given to myself a confidence to keep pushing what I was doing f forward. And that led to the position where I am today. I would say the battle was not easy just to convince people and you keep pushing and then creating evidence that just, you know, make people believe in what you were saying. And then suddenly the awards just was for my, me personally an encouragement, but also a catalyst 
you know, for people to really understand, wow, what he's doing is really great. No, that is what I see and then what it has, uh, how it has supported or, in, you know, influenced my work. And from there to Fritzko Price, you know, yeah. the journey. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, great. And I'm, I'm lucky, simply lucky. Yeah.